The Zone Coverage Podcast Network. Welcome back to another edition of Midwest Swing Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Berardino, and uh, we remind you that you are part of the, or we are part of the Zone Coverage part, Podcast Network, and you can subscribe via iTunes, Spotify, any of your favorite podcast apps. We invite you to please leave a review, and of course, as you know, positive ones only. Now, this week, uh, we have a special guest uh, back for his third go-round with us, um, and I'm, perhaps the loyal listeners will know who I'm talking about because he's setting a record with that third appearance, and we're very fortunate to have him <laughs> back. But we first want to uh, uh, just under just explain to the listeners that co-founder Tom Schreier is not with us. You will not hear the best laugh in the podcast world um, <laughs> during this show. But uh, that was Eric Foster trying to simulate the best <laughs> podcast lab in captivity. But it's it's fruitless. Don't even try. Okay, but Eric, okay. who's at the controls again, can you tell the people why we can't hear Tom's best podcast laugh? Yeah. So Tom is actually in Europe currently, and and he oh. is he's been there for about a week. He's not representing Americans too well currently. He just gave me a story uh, back. I think he was in Prague at the time. We made a joke mm-hmm. about him on another podcast, and he was listening to sure. it as he was walking down the street, and he said he bent over laughing at the joke that we made at the podcast at the nearly the exact same time that someone almost got hit by a car when they were jaywalking. And so he he is laughing over this terrible situation <laughs> and completely unaware that there's someone, there's like a whole drama going on. So so Tom is not here. Yeah. He, he is representing America poorly <laughs> in, in Europe currently. Well, I expected him to do just that, but maybe not in that fashion. <laughs> Tom Schreier, co-founder of zonecoverage.com, uh, is, is, uh, he has not been apprehended and uh, he's not in custody, you're telling me? He's okay? He's still right. at large yep. nope, with he, his podcast <laughs> laugh? Yep, he, okay. he is safe podcast laughing all Great. over inappropriate Great. times in Europe. Well, let's hope that our next guest uh, can help uh, force Tom Schreier into another international incident of sorts. This is Kimball Crossley, longtime professional scout and now a uh, media maven um and uh kimball welcome back thank you it's fun to be back well i hope so and um it's uh you know we've reached the point now where uh, the boston red sox are the world series champions it happens uh, every other year now it seems like and um but now there's all these teams including the red sox are trying to figure out how to win in 2019 and and general managers meetings have started and the whole off season process and free agency and potential trades. And already we're seeing some people come off the board, Eduardo Escobar. I want to talk about him in a minute off the board, CC Sabathia off the board, but plenty of big names on the board. And then some will, who will be overpaid and some will be upset like last year at this stage of a year, as you get into November, Kimball, the typical role of a professional scout is what? Well, you know, it varies. Organizations do it differently. Um, but there's been times where, where we've uh, I've been in an organization that's taken the whole pro scouting staff into a room around this time of year, and we've broken it down. And, um, uh, you know, almost gone, like, you know, went through hypotheticals and said, hey, would you guys do this for this? Each guy, like, let's vote. Who would, who would pay, you know, 70 million over four years who would pay 80 million over you know five who would do this who would do that why and and you know show of hands and and, you know it wasn't like we were going to like vote on it and then come up with an offer for a free agent but it was like you know the gm wanted to know what the whole pro scouting staff felt and you know where they were leaning and some arguments pro and con and so they did that you know a lot of times you'll just have you know they won't meet so it'll just be phone calls you know but you know they have our reports in the office and, you know, you know, it's um, so many fans will say like, well, you know, when you're at a game, who are you here seeing? Well, you're like, well, you're seeing everybody and doing general coverage. And then the reports sit there in the office and they're, they're, you know, for the uh, people in the office to look at whenever they want. And they're not the only report, you know, your report is often one of many going back year, you know, year after year. 
So um, that's all part of it. You know, I mean, I, I can remember there were, you know, there's times as a scout where, you know, I, I might have been the last guy to see a guy. You know, I remember when I, I saw Frank Thomas coming off of his MVP year. So I'm late in the year. And again, I wasn't the only guy who saw him. And it was, you know, and I, every time she's been one of my favorite players and Frank Thomas was coming off that crazy MVP year he had for the Oakland athletics. And, and uh, my recommendation was don't get him. <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> like he, I just don't buy what I'm seeing. I, you know, he's really, he's really cheating to hit the fastball. He's had a monster year. I get that, but it, I'm scared, especially going in long-term on this aging player, but that didn't matter. They did it anyway. <laughs> and I think they're well, it. That's I'm sure there's plenty of scouts laments like that, where, where even pounding the table as you were verbally, but that's the phrase pounding the table against the signing. It still happens. I suppose. Um, well, were you ever in a situation where, or were you asked later to formalize your monetary sense on a player? Did you, did you ever send in, well, four years, 30 million, whatever, uh, well, uh, player by player, so they could crunch all those numbers and crowdsource it the way they do at fan graphs? Well, in those meetings, yes. Like, what, one of the things you're told as a scout um, when you write a report on a player is they usually tell you, don't play GM. Like, don't, don't include your finan- the finances and, and, you know, his value on the report. Just tell us who the player, you know, what the player can do, what you expect him to do, and we'll decide, you know, don't, don't like write your report saying this guy's terrible just because you don't want us to get him because you think he's got too high of a salary. You know, who knows? Maybe the other team will eat the salary. So they say, don't play GM, just write the report. Now in those meetings, they will, you know, another story was, and it's sort of interesting because he's, he's back in free agency now, but Jay Happ, you know, and mm-hmm. Jay Happ had been with the Blue Jays when I was with the Blue Jays. And then he, you know, we had let him trade him and then he bounced around a little bit and then he got to Pittsburgh and had a great run. And I happened to be, advancing Pittsburgh for in case he met them down the line in the world series. So all September long, I watched Jay Happ start after start. He must've started like five times that month. And I was really impressed. I thought something's taken. He's really become really aggressive with his fastball. He's, he's really taken it to another level for a guy that at the time was 32, 33 years old. And so I remember we were talking in the meetings and my boss knew I was not one to spend a lot of money. I was usually like, a na- you know, a no vote on most contracts. I said, nope, nope, too much, too steep. We can do better elsewhere. Money and so he said, he knew I liked cap. And he said, all right, would you do, you know, three years, 39 million. And he said, if it was three years, 42, Kimball, would you throw up in your mouth? <laughs> oh, <God>. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a parcels, a parcels type comment and i'll never forget that and i said no i wouldn't and um we oh. went about that for we went about that for jay Happ and we got him so that, that might have been do you think, more than your listeners, do you think... <laughs> <laughs> listeners wanted to hear but yeah i uh, you know this is a podcast <laughs> that generally people like to listen to over lunch kimball so uh perhaps that, <laughs> uh, that you've ruined their lunch break but um and that's okay but do you think that your <laughs> word meant enough at that moment financially that if you had said, I just did throw up in my mouth at $42 million, <laughs> do they do they back off and say, no, we, we can't do that. We don't want Kimball to become ill. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think that's the case, no? especially since the offer wasn't going to go down right then. And, you know, again, it's a scout. One of the mysteries of being a scout is you really don't know how much weight your, your – uh, opinion carries like you know it's very rare there's only a couple of stories i can tell you of like where i got to pick a player or like there's a list of guys and i sort of pointed to one and said that's the one i want and it was like okay that's the one we're taking most times it's a group effort it's a collaborative hell a lot of times the gm's probably made up his mind before you even asked the question he just wants to you know either hear your confirmation or you to say no and then he's just going to still do what he wants so it's more like that Talking with Kimball Crossley, the most interesting man in the scouting world, as we like to call him. That's a trademark pending. And uh, in the <laughs> last decade and a half, he, he worked for the Blue Jays, and um, they restructured their scouting department. And people who've heard Kimball's uh, recent appearances, this is appearance number three, we've been blessed to have him because he's in demand out there. He's showing up on a variety of outlets, and BostonGlobe.com ran his uh, – postseason uh, breakdowns uh, going into those series, um, the ALCS, I believe, and the World Series, but um, which is pretty cool. 
But Kimball, I'm you know one of the things that I like to do this time of year, and I and I think our listeners are savvy to this. That the MLB trade rumors folks do a tremendous job all year, but then they try to put dollar sign on the muscle, as it were, uh, at, at and rank a top fifty of um, free agents. And I'm going to just scan through their list here because obviously uh, there's plenty of talk. You know, it's just it's mind blowing. This is Scott Boris well, Olympics time here where he tries well, to get, you know, like Bryce, Bryce Harper, they <laughs> put a 14 year, 14 years, by the way, $420 million on, on a uh, Bryce Harper. And, you know, I, and of course, right behind that is Machado uh, to the Phillies. They also try to figure out well, where they'll land in the uh, Phillies, but, but well, hold on, but Phillies are 13 million, 300 or 13 years, 390 million for Machado. What, what did you want to say, Kimball? I want to tell you why you're scanning down the list that I, I was out in the fall league um, for a conference and I ran into Terry Ryan and I hope I'm not speaking out of school when I tell you that Terry Ryan heard me on your podcast. So, Oh boy, boy that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> he said, I heard that podcast. You guys did a good job. So I thought your listeners might enjoy that. I hope I don't, I don't think I'm really giving anything away for Terry there. And, you know, <laughs> but anyway, go on. Not. Let's hope not, or your career is over. But uh, Terry's <laughs> wonderful. That's uh, if that's true, he might have just been nice and might have just come across his Twitter because I know he's a big Twitter guy. No, if Terry, <laughs> if Terry listened to the podcast, now I'm going to have to rein it in and be more, be more, uh, you know, professional. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm going to forget that I, I ever heard that. Hi, Terry. So, um, all right. Kimball, the, uh, the the good folks at MLB Trade Rumors, uh, Tim Dirks and uh, Steve Adams among them. Uh, they the first time a player, and of course this is a Minnesota-based podcast, and so we're gonna we're gonna always tailor it where we can to Twins fans. How would you? Um, and I don't know if you've scanned the Twins roster. I don't know if it's fair to ask you to play Twins GM at this stage, but together we'll just kind of bat it around. What, the first name they have coming to the Twins, Marwin Gonzalez of the Astros always like this guy, but they have him at four years, 36 million in a super utility role. And there's going to be plenty of interest in Marwin Gonzalez. I would think, um, how does that strike you as the twins? First of all, as a potential fit and then does four for 36 feel about right. No four for 36 feels light. It feels like it's too low. Like he's going to get more than okay. that. Um, okay. but where he's, do you not see going? Up, uh, he's not, he's what, not what coming off as good a year as he went. Well, I'll only say this, that, you know, like if anybody's ever been in a fantasy league and you go into your fantasy draft and it's funny because you're thinking like, I think I'm going to sneak away with this guy. There's this guy out there that I think is sort of under the radar. And then you get in the draft and like eight other guys are thinking the exact same thing. That is Marwin exactly. Gonzalez. I think every team's thinking, you know, because face it, he's, he can fit in any club. So, you know, some teams are like, look, you know, thankfully, like, look, we're out on this great first base and we got a first base and then they don't even have to think about it and they don't have to, you know, mull over spending millions of dollars on that guy and whether it's a good or bad contract. But Marwin, because of his versatility, can help any club. <laughs> and so and and so it's like everyone's like, oh, if we can get him on the cheap. So everyone's thinking I can maybe we can sneak in and get that him. You know, he's pretty good. So I think it's going to cause a bidding war and he's going to go for – you know, more than you think. And, you know, it's, it's always tough to guess these things because every year we, we are shocked, you know, our jaw hits the floor with some contracts. So I don't know, I'd say four or 50 million, you know, like uh, for Marwin, um, you know, and Plus so the Scott the, Boris factor, Scott Boris uh, in, with his internal R and D and his people there. Uh, and of course his own ability to consistently outperform the market or what you would expect. I mean, there's a Boris, premium right i mean it's one of his favorite words premiums and um yeah marwin marwin will not uh, come cheap and 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 uh, mlb trade rumors makes the point too kimball like you do that more than you could find a fit for more of the uh, for marwin on more than half the rosters so um yeah that's um that's you know that all okay. factors in all right so so let that be noted eric foster write that down Got it. Four years, fifty million. Marwin Gonzalez, not a twin, correct? It's going to just get out of control. <laughs> yeah. All right, next, yep. because I want to, I want to get to a lot of names. Uh, number seventeen, right behind Marwin, is uh, Yuri's Familia, the the uh, ex closer, ends up uh, set up role for the for the A's. There's some makeup questions there with the history. Uh, 
of a, a domestic violence charge that was later dropped, but he did get suspended for 15 games, and they have him going to the Twins for three years, $33 million. First of all, Twins are going to need some help at the back of the bullpen, I think. Maybe it's Fernando Rodney coming back. Um, why not? But Familia, three for 33, is the number about right? And what is the level of concern in the game over the makeup? Well, you know, uh, I think the makeup with him might be a little overplayed. Um, I, I, I don't know if, like, he, uh, that's fair for him. I, but I do think uh, he will probably get that from somebody. Um, I would caution anybody to spend any money like that on just about any reliever. I think I forget if we talked about it because we've been on this, I've been on the show so many times, <laughs> but yes. um, if we talked about the study where, you know, it showed that like the reliever value for dollars is almost like an inverse relationship. Like the more you spend, the less you get. And it was a no, we, you did not you, share. That's a good factoid. You did not share that on the show. Well, and I, I believe one of my, it. Many other media, and many other media appearances. But no kidding. Like, yes. the, you know, it was a great study. Um, uh, and I saw it a couple months ago, and, and it was it was a pretty thorough study. But you're looking at like you know all the money the Rockies spent on their bullpen, and mm-hmm. and having been been in an organization, you know, where where it's, it's sort of a feeling throughout. But that said, you know, talking about how every every team could use a Marwin Gonzalez. Every team could use a reliever. It's not like, oh, we've got already got a reliever, or we've already got four, we've already got five, especially now. It's like, well, we need seven, eight, nine, ten. And so, so you know, when you have a good arm like that, and depending on how well they saw him thrown in September, the money, yeah, he could get three for 33, you know, and it's, it's similar to what other guys have gotten. Um, but, you know, I would certainly caution against it for any team, and not because of any makeup concerns, but just because I don't believe in spending that much on, on really any reliever. No, I'm I'm with you. I think typically uh, bullpens are best built uh, organically and with failed starters or, um, you know, just just pleasant surprises. And the velo a lot of times uh, changes from year to year. Certainly for left-hander, and there's no worse spending. Would you agree than for a situational left-hander just because you're going to use him so sporadically and be- and because their performance year to year changes so drastically. Yeah, you know, but that's feel like the game has gone away from that. Like, you really don't feel like too many teams are using that. Like, you know, but I'll, I'll bring up a guy that we talked about before, and I know we talked about this guy, even though I can never pronounce his name, and that's my boy, Busenitz, right? Busenitz, no, right? The, no, try again. Well, well, well anyway, Busenitz, uh, how do you say his that's it. name? That's it, Busenitz. Right. I think he changes right. it day to day. He changes it. Well, but, one of my, one we'll, of just, my we'll just call him Alan. Allen. Alan, one of my favorite exercises is I always would say, like, suppose we just took a name off the top of the scouting report and we looked at the body of the report and we said, like, look at his fastball velo, look at his fastball command, look at his breaking stuff, look at his, you know, his other off stuff, look at his command, you know, give me some other things. And if we just took the name off, you know, Busnitz, you know, and Familia might have pretty similar reports, like plus stuff, you know, kind of like it's all about if they throw strikes, whatever. And of course, one is could get waived if they sign somebody, and one is the guy you're talking about spending thirty three million dollars on. And I don't think there's that much difference. Now there is a difference. Familiar's done it before. Familiar has probably more confidence. You know, familiar, for example, does get ground balls. But but is it that much difference to go that far? And and so I th- you know that's the kind of thing that I think about. Like I think let's go find the next familiar, not pay for the last one. Yeah, it seems like three for thirty three is a common guesstimate here on MLB trade rumors, uh, which knows what they're, they're doing, whether it's arbitration numbers they try to figure out in advance uh, or the free agency market. But, um, you know, free agency has been recalibrated. I think we can both agree um, based on the current CBA, the way teams are emphasizing uh, age more than ever and uh, running you know, the analytics showing that once you cross that 30 year old threshold, which we've always known uh, what our prime years were, Bill James explained that long ago, three decades ago, but people were able to talk themselves into long-term deals. Um, once you cross 30, especially, you know, even for catchers, but now it's just like anybody once you, the, the red light starts blinking. So three for 33 for a number of relievers, including uh, Zach Britton, who's had uh, a number of injury concerns and David Robertson, who seems pretty solid to me. They have a uh, Britain ending up uh, with the Astros who tried to trade for him a few years ago before they 
settled for Giles, I believe, and Robertson to the Mets. And let's see who the next uh, twin is. Oh, here's a twin for you. One that the twin did. I could potentially see this guy because the twins tried to get him to come to Minnesota before he got out to Seattle. I believe when he was going off Baltimore to Seattle, that's Nelson Cruz, the ageless Nelson Cruz. Now 38, he's averaged 41 homers per year over the last five years. Now the twins gave a lot of DH at bats to the likes of Robbie Grossman uh, and Tyler Austin and friends. Now, if they had, uh, Nelson Cruz is their DH. Do you think two years, 30 million at this stage of his career and life is uh, something you could see? Well, you know, that, that is the most reasonable one you've suggested yet. <laughs> um, and I think that's because the two years, right? Like when a guy is coming off of a good year, it's not hard to say, well, and he's coming off really, you know, 10 straight good years. And you look at the number and it's scary, but the age number, I should say, but if you're only talking a year or two and that much money, if you make a mistake, you make a mistake. You're not living with it for years. And especially when you're talking about signing a DH, because if you sign a DH long term and it screws up, you have really screwed up your roster. So, you know, that one, I, I could see him coming off another good year and then, then, you know, feeling they have a bit of a hole there. And the other thing too, you know, there's familiarity for Thad Levine, general manager of the twins because he had Nelson Cruz in Texas. He's part of winning situation. That's really where Nelson Cruz became Nelson Cruz was as, as a Ranger uh, as they were winning back-to-back pennants. Um, you know, he, he had the steroid uh, ding. He had, he had his uh, suspension, but um, he's, uh, he's come through it. Um, and it seems like that's less and less of a concern for people as they, um, assess uh, who to pick up these days, but you know, just like you say, a, a decade thought. I mean, this will probably surprise some people, but uh, going back to 2008, Nelson Cruz OPS plus park and league adjusted is 134, 34 percent above average. Uh, he's wow. just been really good, and um, you know, I've talked to him a little bit. I think I've never heard. Uh, any problems, no red flags about him as a teammate, that sort of thing. I, I think he's very well regarded, actually. So that's somebody getting Nelson Cruz in, in the abstract, two years, 30 million. That may be light uh, considering the production. But yes, as, as like we said, as, they, as we talk more and more about uh, what you have left, that's, um, that's, that's going to tamp down the years and the dollars. So that's Nelson Cruz. There's some people have suggested Jed Lowry could end up as a twin, but they have um, MLB trade rumors as him going back to the A's three years, 30 million. Um, let's see if there's another twin here on the top 50. And of course the twins historically are pretty careful with their dollars. Um, free agent wise. Um, it's not uh, something they get too far out on. It worked out with Irvin Santana, Terry Ryan, the aforementioned Terry Ryan brought in um well, three different guys uh, in a in a short period in two different two straight off seasons that really, um, I'd say, uh, nailed it on Urban Santana. Four years, fifty five million. Phil Hughes, the first deal worked out great because it was three years, uh, twenty seven million with some escalators. He pitched great the first year, set a record for strikeout to walk ratio, and then they extended him, and that was the mistake. That wasn't on the free market, and it didn't work out because of the uh, multiple thoracic outlet syndrome problems. And then Ricky Nolasco is the other one, which you kind of had a bad feeling about from the start that that would be four for 49, that that would not pay off. And then he had injury problems. And, and um, so basically uh, maybe one and a half out of three on those. Um, uh, I'm getting down here into the forties here and there's plenty of, uh, and, and well, Irvin Santana aforementioned Irvin, no more twin uh, signings expected that's just those uh three familia uh cruz and marwin uh that's what mlb trade rumors has for the twins now Irvin santana one year six million to the mariners which is a great place to pitch um that would be interesting he'll be uh 36 uh coming up here next month what do you what do you think for Irvin santana do you have any any strong thoughts on this guy coming off well, with a tremendous loss of velocity all because of a finger. Well, right. And that, that's where you go. Like, if you think it's just his finger and, you know, again, talking about the two-year deals, I know, you know, um, 
Tim Beatty, uh, another former GM, he used to say there's no such thing as a bad one-year deal, you know, because if it doesn't work it out, you, you know, you're done with it, right? And and even, like, you don't feel bad. If it's a one-year deal and it's not going well too after two or three months, even waving that guy, you know, is not a big deal. Like, the money spent, is, there's no, no upside down the line. So, you know, any anytime you're talking about that, if, and again, if a team can steal that away, a guy bouncing back from a pitcher, and that's where, you know, you talk to your scouts and say, hey, look, I saw him before that finger injury, and he was throwing as well as ever. You know, I, I'm pretty sure that's it. Maybe talk to pitching people and say, like, oh, yeah, that's what's going on. And you go with it, you know, and I know their, their GM is a former pitcher himself, Jerry DePoto. So, yeah, any, like, if you can steal that. You know, talking about your twins, though, so you, the, you would look at looking at the roster, the major – Need is infield, would you not say? I mean, everyone wants to upgrade their pitching, but they've ser- seriously depleted their infield with the last couple. You know, the things the way things well, have done last year. Not, yes, they they can be flexible on that though, because Polanco could play second, probably better than he plays short. Um, so depending on the market or what's available, and I always prefer to look into the trade market first because you know there's there's always opportunity for bounce back there or or, or need for need. Miguel Sano, can you trust him at third base physically? I think when he's fully healthy, he can play third still, even even at a larger weight. But he says he's going to get down under 250 working with a former Olympic sprinter. So maybe he won't be able to play third base anymore, but he'll be able to to have higher sprint speed. I don't know. Um, and then, um, you know, Brian Dozier not coming back uh, via free agency, almost certainly. Um, Nick Gordon, not uh, he's lost steam as a prospect at triple a so that's not someone you can plug in there so yeah they need you know of course first base joe mauer likely to retire i think we can say but you have tyler austin in-house who showed some serious thump when he was healthy enough but he's been marred by injury throughout his young career but but raw power ridiculous um, yeah, I guess Kimball that, uh, they, you know, that's why, uh, someone like a Marvin Gonzalez who can bounce around, play a few spots, covers them against downturns. Right. Uh, so, so here's the I don't know, for you. Who, do you have a guy, do you have a, do you have a guy well, that you think look, plugs I, in better? Lowry's been well, mentioned just for that reason. I mean, this guy, you know, the problem with a lot of free agents, right. Is you, you catch them on the wrong side of 30. Well, at least this guy, Freddie Galvis is 29, right. I like um, him. Yeah. yeah. And so like, you know, he's, he's not great, but you know, one can make some, start making some arguments. He's kind of got like a power approach and he, he's coming from a ballpark where that approach doesn't play San Diego, you know, going to mm-hmm. a league and a place where maybe that approach plays better. Again, he's not old. He's kind of under the radar, having never really played under the lights, you know, <laughs> and pretty, he's played in some pretty bad teams, pretty obscure situations. So you know, whereas Marlon, I liked him, you know, I liked him as a Philly, a, a yeah. home runner yeah, too. That, that, so that's, so a, that, you that's know, a good that, call. That could be a name for you. Um, but you know, so then you I, would I, move. You get, would play him at short. Hey, you would you would play him at short. Move Polanco to second, right? Right there, you go. And then you have yeah. Adrian's yeah. as your backup, and yeah, I, it does sound like that's their need. You know, but as you were alluding to, like I'm a big believer in like you know not going big on on free agency and trying to solve your problems elsewhere but you know again referring to fantasy baseball it's it's almost like a lot of teams are taking the approach now like sit back like a lot of people do in drafts and and let other people pay big money and then pick guys off at the end for a bargain basement and we've seen that happen a little bit in the free agent world you know these guys have sat out there and they get a little itchy come you know february and march and and all of a sudden they're signing you know relatively low deals and i think we see that some slow playing some of these free agents. So, you know, that can happen with this market. Well, you have to be careful with that. I, I, I do like that in the abstract. And that's what the twins certainly were all in on this past year, um, signing Logan Morrison late in the process, late February, two weeks after that signing Lance Lynn. And these guys had uh, very abbreviated spring trainings. Alex Cobb ended right. up with the Orioles in the same circumstance. And people are like, well, dollar for dollar, this should work out fine. But in each case, the performance was not there. And Lance Lynn, according to MLB Trade Rumors, is the number 36th ranked free agent, and he could end up with a raise two years, $16 million, 
which you know, Lance Lynn turned down a qualifying offer. That's, you know, there, then there's the aspect that he was kicking himself over that. And he ends up signing one year, 12 million with the chance for escalators that he did not reach. He was miserable the whole time and pitched like it. So I think there's, we learned, we were reminded, I think deep down, everybody knows that there's the human element, but of free agency, you know, there's guys that get signed. I remember Jason Castro being signed very early in the process by Falvin, Derek Falvey and Thad Levine, uh, trademark pending, uh, in 16. And he came to their off season program. He came to twins fest and he was just delighted to be a twin because they gave him three years, 24.5 million. And he, and he was signed well before he was signed around Thanksgiving and he had holiday time where it was just accepting congratulations and grandma was happy and the mother-in-law was happy and everybody knew they're going to Minnesota and he had a pretty good first year, Jason Castro now going into the third year of the deal. You can question the overall deal, but I'm just saying from a player perspective, he was gleeful as gleeful as Jason Castro gets. He's pretty low key, but Kimball, how do you factor in that? You have to know the person that you're waiting on into February and March, don't you? To know if that person is going to hit the ground running ready to go. Now, in both Lynn and Morrison's case, they were working out where they're at Cressy, who's as good as it gets in baseball preparation. They're down in Jupiter working out with him, among others. Um, and uh, it didn't work out. They, they did not have good years. How do you factor in the guy's ability to come off the disappointment of the free agency and then perform? Yeah, no, that's that's a good call. You know, although I, I would say that's kind of a soft factor. You know, there's a lot of guys that would say, well, how about the, the prove it factor, the anger factor? Why don't they come in like, you know, breathe in fire and say, I'm going to show you all that I'm worth a lot more than this low budget contract I signed. But I do think the, the important thing is uh, be careful of, you know, you don't want to wait so late that the guy does not go into spring training. But, you know, I don't know if those examples would scare me off as like, like, oh, see, there there you go with that phenomenon. Because mm-hmm. I think you point to probably some other examples of of guys, you know, the most famous in history being the Andre Dawson, you know, uh, Blank factor contract. when Andre, <laughs> right, right, where he just came in and just tore it up, you know, because he was, had so much to prove. Well, that was, that was outright collusion. There was a lot of talk of collusion. <laughs> in fact, one of the main proponents of that concept or, or the main uh, – I guess uh, accusers is now on the other side of the coin. And that's uh, Brody Van Wagenen uh, going from CAA to Mets GM. That's uh, fascinating in itself. Um, of course it, it's happened. Rob Palinka uh, runs the Lakers now and he used to be a top agent, but it hasn't happened a whole lot in baseball. Jeff Morad took over ownership, but generally those agents to do that. And I think Brody would have been one of them would be taking a pay cut to come over to the, management side but he did it maybe that to me that's an under another indication Kimball that the funny money days are if not over they're certainly changed they're fundamentally changed and I think this brings me to Eduardo Escobar all right so I already talked about Marlon Gonzalez and you could see him getting 50 million over four years he's better than Eduardo Escobar I think we can agree he can play outfield well and Eduardo cannot we've seen him attempt it he cannot but the guy hit nearly 50 doubles, tremendous teammate, Does has about the same year typically every year, and this year just the doubles. We attribute those to Nicolas Cage meeting him in Puerto Rico. That's that's scientific. That's proven. Uh, <laughs> Kimball, if you were representing Eduardo Escobar, or, you know, would you, well, if you were representing him, what would your reaction have been to that three-year $21 million offer that he took from the Diamondbacks? You know, he probably, I would say, boy, maybe you should have cashed in elsewhere because he was coming off a pretty darn good year, your boy, Eduardo Escobar. And, right, you know, like if you just go to the, the metrics, which is what so many clubs use now and the, the data, I mean, like, and you look at his wins above replacement level and stuff like that, you know, uh, and at 29 years old, like it, you can see why, you know, maybe that was good. You know, we talk about jumping in late. Well, you know, if everyone's going to jump in late, you jump in early, right? So maybe the Dimebacks did a great job of just, you know, jumping on that and extending him. And um, 
you know, maybe they got a pretty good player, but you, you don't think he's really like, you think there's some defensive concerns there, huh? Um, yeah, I do. I think his best position, maybe his only position soon will be third. And that's pretty yeah, much how they used him because of Jake Lamb, but he's not really super utility. He's not, a, he's not super utility because he cannot play the outfield. He just cannot. Second base has never been good for him. He's passable at shortstop, say four times a week, but he's going, as he's added the thump, you know, he's, he's changed his body. He's not, he's not huge. He's, he's always going to be a little guy, but he's, uh, he's just more muscular and, and he does not move around as well. So, you know, that's what they, but he did give them, according to fan graphs. Yes. It, it is ridiculous. He was a three and a half win player above replacement right. per fan graphs and this you, year. So it, that seven million a year for that kind of guy, even if he tails back and becomes a one win player, you, you, you know, you win. Right. And that's, you know, you know, again, you're talking about like, it feels like that's the going rate these days. You're paying about nine, $10 million for a win. And so, you know, um, so if they feel like he's, he's, he's there, then they're getting a bargain. So do you have, um, do you have Mark, a guy on the free agent list? Or do you have a guy in the free agent list uh, that you just want to throw out there and just say, get it on record that this guy is you know, yeah. going to be, uh, or a couple of names that you think will probably be underpaid, but will outperform their next contract. I just have a funny feeling. We, you know, we haven't seen the last of Lonnie Chisholm Hall and, um, you know, it's just like, he's a name that, that pops up and I go like, every time it seems like his career is about to get going, he, something happens. Now, look, he's got calf injuries the last couple of years. And this year, basically his whole season was shot because of it. Um, and that scares you, you know, and as, as you're looking at Josh Donaldson, same thing, like this is something that recurs, you know, and, and you wonder if they can solve it, but that's where I'd say like, you know, you know, you're looking at a player, you know, he's only 30 years old. I still think he, he was just figuring things out with the bat when he kept getting hurt. That's a guy that I'd be, I'd be intrigued by. And, and, you know, of course, who knows, like, you know, for example, I was surprised that Cleveland, you know, sort of cut, cut, cut him loose there. And, and uh, so there's a guy, I think similarly in a funny way, different, different body, different athlete, but maybe Matt Adams is a little under the radar, you know, um, you know, is it another guy that's not, you know, that old and, and really has, has uh, shown some good production. Um, you know, so that that's, you know, those are two guys I'm looking at the re- a lot of the guys, like it really feels like they're on a, the scary side of 30 and you're seeing a dip in their production. And in and, and those two guys also, you, you don't think they're not really in the position to ask for multiple years. They're not coming off all-star season. They're not coming yeah. off playing every day. You know what I mean? So it, it just feels like but like those guys, where you should take Wilson Ramos, it feels like everyone's going to be jumping on board, you know, a guy like that. And um, even Jed Lowry at 34 is coming off of a great year and, 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 and playing every day for several years. And, you know, so he's going to look to get paid. And, and at 34, that scares you. I would almost have a blanket rule if I were in a front office that um... – I don't know where you'd set it, but anybody who had, who was coming off a year in which they were 20% above their career norm or something in, in whatever metric you want to choose. Um, I just, I just, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even attempt to sign that guy You're <laughs> begging for trouble. Um, especially if it's a pitcher, but um, now to catchers, well, that's the where twins could, con- you know, let me just get to catchers real quick. Cause I, you, you mentioned Wilson Ramos and that's an ex twin briefly prospect uh, and it's nagged at twins fans forever. And here that, you know, they didn't play on him last year cause he had the knee problem and uh, he's out there again, projected for three years and 36 million to the Astros who are again in the market for catching cause McCann is at the wall and Gaddis really can't catch. And, um, but does Monty Grandal almost, I'll ask you a, an either, or who would you rather have? Because Yasmani Grandal it checks a lot of boxes, and of course, uh, former host of this show and still friend of the program, uh, Brandon Warren has said repeatedly the Twins. He's on record. He'd, he'd like to see the Twins sign Grandal to be their catcher. Well, uh, MLB Trade Rumors projects four years, sixty-four million for Grandal to the Nationals, taking Ramos' wow. place. 
Um, how would you feel about signing? Well, I come to you in the room. We're in the scout room. We're in, we're in the meeting room. We're having a, with a three agency meeting. The Dodgers didn't even trust Grandal to catch for them in in World Series games. Going with Austin Barnes instead, you're going to give this guy four years, sixty four million, Kimball. Well, I can't answer because I just threw up in my mouth. <laughs> 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 you were no, saving I, that it's minute five. No, no but the uh, really, it's no look, fair. I know, own straight I, I know Grandal is coming off a really good year uh, until the postseason hit, and then it all fell apart. And that was interesting. That might scare people off or say, "Hey, look, let that scare other people off." It was a couple of you know bad games, but you know catchers. Over 30, long-term deal, come on. <laughs> you know, that scares the life out of me. And, and especially, you know, Ramos has had some injuries too. Um, man, that just seems kind of steep. But, but you know, I, I think there's certain teams, we all, you know, we haven't really made this point on the, on the podcast, but it's, 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 it's relevant, you know, that everybody's playing a little bit different game, you know, in that, in that I guess what is, Grandal turns 30 tomorrow. Is that right? But everyone, so the Dodgers and the Yankees and the Red Sox can do things that other teams don't. And for example, when I was with the Blue Jays, we knew we were overpaying Russell Martin. We knew we were giving him five years and hoping he'd give us three, but we wanted that good catcher now, you know? And, and I think if teams know that and can afford to do that, but guess what? Some teams can't, some teams their contract hamstrings them for several years, that bad contract. So, so every contract's a little different. Um, and every team that signs contracts is a little different. So I think that there you go. So, yeah, like, you know, someone wants to say, well, I'm going to get two or three good years out of Grandal and I don't care about the fourth or fifth. Great. You know, especially a catcher that has no versatility because, like, now what's he going to do if, he, if, if you feel like he's unplayable? Um, so, you know, and like, look at, you know, if you notice the season Russell Martin had this year for the Blue Jays, it was pretty terrible. Um, but, yeah. you know, he had given us, you had given us a couple of good years there and, and especially that first one. So I would just say no on that, but I'm thinking as a team that wants to be good every year and not just like go for it one year. And uh, yeah, but that kind of contract just scares me. Two more. Um, we're talking with Kimball Crossley. Uh, longtime professional baseball scout and current free agent himself. Uh, so he gets to do a little media time before he secures his next uh, position, which we know will be coming soon. Cause it's, as you can tell from this conversation, the man knows the game. Um, and I know he's still holding back some stuff here, but uh, <laughs> that's, 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 I know he's holding back, uh, but uh, I'm not, not holding, holding back. back the, the, the uh, puking in the mouth comments, but uh, two more uh, uh, former twins that uh, are on this list, pretty high, you know, at least in the top 32 for MLB trade rumors, and we'll just get a quick thought on it. But they project uh, Brian Dozier to the Nationals, who did have trade interest in him back in the great offseason Dozier Derby of 16-17 that went nowhere. One year, $10 million for the diminished Brian Dozier, which is kind of sad. Um, and uh, and Ebal Sanchez, old friend, uh, still the only uh, no hitter, I, uh, author of the only no hitter I ever covered. Um, he is projected. He was released out of Twins camp in March because they didn't have a fit for him because they were going to get Lance Lynn. They had him at basically close to the minimum, a couple million, two years, twenty-two million for a resurgent finesser, and Ebal Sanchez to the Giants where the park being so massive, that would be a, a perfect for him. And, um, fly ball guy, change up guy, uh, junk baller. But, uh, uh, do those numbers sound about right? Have you, have you, uh, even thought about them uh, lately? Well, think, I think of this, and this is kind of funny because as much as I don't want pitchers on long-term deals, cause like it feels like a pitcher could go in any moment in a funny way, when you're trusting what you see with your eyes in a certain age, you know, a pitcher is almost more reliable. So, like, if, 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 you know, whatever Sanchez did this year, which was quite impressive, those scouts sitting behind the home plate, which I was not one of this year, I did not see him pitch this year, were watching him. And they're saying, hey, that's 92, and it's crisp, and it's on the corner, and it's commanding it. And then, the, hey, that breaking ball, that changeup's pretty good. Like, you know, 
I don't know what was wrong with them the last two years, but blank, you know, I trust what I see. And look, any pitcher can get hurt any time, you know, whether you're 27 or 35. And if he's throwing well, and which he must have been throwing well last year, and you say, let's take a flyer. And so that contract, not too long. Conversely, like, you know, I would ask you, like, what happened to Dozier? I mean, talk about a guy that, you know, two years ago was still, like, giving elite production and just, he looks so bad in the postseason, right? I mean, offensively, defensively, yeah. just like the body slowed down. And I'll, I'll, you know, give credit to our old friend Ed Price, um, who, uh, you know, former baseball writer, who he was one of the first people to say, like, nope, people think catchers go second baseman when they go, they go. And I was like, and mm-hmm. I thought about that a lot when I watched Dozier last year, and going like, what happened to this guy? You know. It's just what a terrible season. Did he, you know, did he have some injury that people don't talk about? Was there something yes. going on? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. He had a knee injury uh, going back to uh, the April, really. He was sent for an MRI right. in April, and he played through it. Now, habits, as you know, bad habits can develop from this. Uh, confidence can be lost. It's such a confidence game. Uh, he could not, he, or, you know, there were uh, people in the scouting world wondering, uh, in uh, June, July, uh, what Dozier had left, conversations in the press box, there was concern about his ability to get to balls to either side that he typically would, would be able to place he would make. Just so the defense slowed down, the, he wasn't the threat on the bases. And then the last thing to go was, yeah, that he could not catch up to the same uh, high inside fastball that he would pull down. He'd just jerk it down the left field line for 40 plus So was it, his, uh, was it his right knee, his right knee or his left? Mm. I, I'm I, well, I'm blanking on it, I'm, but that I'm would make a difference, bet. of course. Uh, I believe it. I believe it was the right knee. Yes, because that's yeah, why he could bet. not keep his legs. It was. He, he, right. It wasn't landing. Well, it was the push off. So I think that's huge. And like you know, for different players, that might not be so big. But the biggest flaws that we saw in his game, right, were turning the double play, which of course is you know your right knee, your right leg pushing off and putting something on that throw and. He didn't have a lot on his DP throws, which turned out to be costly in that series. Um, and then, uh, you know, for a guy that is kind of a, a jerk power hitter like Dozier, that really, you know, is trying to pull the ball. And he, so that would explain how bad he looked because even when he did get a pitch that he would normally drive, because he's sitting there trying to like find something that he can pull it didn't go the same way it did. So now you become a guy that has holes all over because even if I make a mistake to him, he's not going to get it, yank it out of the park. And so, so that would explain a lot. So yeah, you, you go one year on Dozier having a bounce back again, there's no bad one year deals. And you know, if it fits, it fits, you know, that sounds, you know, Hey, you want to go one ten million million on a guy that used to produce, you know, $40 million worth of value um, just a couple of years ago. That's, that makes some sense. Um, but you know, that's always where like you, you sign him, he's one position guy, right? Like he's, it's like, it's hard for him to be a backup or utility player. Cause it's not like he's playing short or third or first or left, right? It's he's your second baseman, you know, for better or worse. That's, that's a good signing. If you, I say that's a good signing. If I had a young second baseman that was, I wasn't sure if he's ready to come up from triple a or not. And you say, we'll start the year with Dozier. And if he, if he doesn't bounce back, we'll play the kid. And if he does bounce back, great. We had a great year out of him. Maybe we trade him and midway through the year, maybe we play out the year. We're in the playoffs with him and the kid gets another year of service of, of development. You know, I don't know if that's a, a Gordon situation, you know, bring him home, but I don't know. Doubtful. It'd be great. I don't know. <laughs> Dozier remains so popular with twins fans and the teammates, et cetera. But they, I do sense that uh, the twins are in the midst of a relentless churn that will uh, only be complete when there are no holdovers left and um, that may happen by 2020 it's uh, they're, they're kind of on that they're, they're putting their own individual stamp on this uh, as a front office and they're finding they just have different likes and dislikes and and just obviously are trying to trying to turn it around but those I'm with you Kimball I, and I'm glad we were able to figure that out I think the, the I, my takeaway from that burst of knowledge by you was that um, as long as you can explain a downturn, as long as there's a reasonable theory, and that one was perfectly explainable, um, 
then a risk, a small risk, a moderate risk is is uh, it's uh, merited. If if there's no good explanation for why someone fell off a cliff, well, then maybe you shouldn't go there. Uh, that's maybe the lesson for free agency. But for every rule we can possibly throw out there, there's an opposite bromide, and you can go with that. But uh, you have been listening to Midwest Swing Podcast, part of the Zone Coverage Podcast Network. You can subscribe via iTunes, Spotify, any of your favorite podcast apps. We invite you to leave a review. Um, on that review, you can ask why Tom Schreier was in Europe while we were recording this podcast. And you can certainly praise the work of Eric Foster, who was at the controls again. And I think he's still there. And yes, um, am, yes. he's, he's outstanding. Thank you, Eric, because uh, um, none of this, this would just be a phone call. Uh, without you uh, doing that properly. We have been talking once again for the third time, and let's hope the final time we have <laughs> on the <this> show. <laughs> Kimble, <laughs> long time what professional a, what baseball. What a wonderful yeah, send-off. Is... Everybody, anybody ever got such a great send-off? In there? <laughs> I don't mean it's the last time we'll ever speak to you in any form, but uh, here on the podcast, we hope that you will be gobbled up very soon. And well, look, I'm, I'm looking for a scouting job. I predict, I predict that Kimball mm. Crossley will sign somewhere before Brian Dozier signs. I'll, I'll make that right. prediction right now. And um, and so we, we wait uh, with bated breath to see where that will be and to know that he would never be available for a podcast again. So those of you who've listened, and thank you, Terry Ryan, for listening again. Thank you. And uh, we hope you'll come on the podcast soon. And um, until next week, I'm your host, Mike Berardino. You can follow me at Twitter, at Mike Berardino. You can follow Kimball on Twitter, but he's not going to be honest there. And, uh, and we'll see you next week.